Hello and welcome to the FMCC webinar, Is Facility Management to Blame for Workplace Injuries? How the Choices Facility Managers Make Can Lead to Injuries in the Workplace, presented by Allison Heller Ono. Next slide, please. I do want to let everyone know they have been muted for audio quality. If you do have any questions at any time during this webinar, please feel free and type them into the question box, and we'll go over them during the Q&A portion at the end of the webinar. Next slide, please. And here is the mission statement and the vision statement of the FMCC. Also, if you want a PDF of the PowerPoint, please feel free and download to the handout section on your control panel. Next slide, please. The FMCC does provide many services to the FM community, such as ask the expert, find a consultant, locate a speaker, and online educational resources. You may find more information at their website, fmcc.ifma.org. Next slide, please. And the FMCC does like to thank our sponsors. Next slide. And I do want to thank everyone for joining us for today, the official day, official World FM Day, even though we are actually celebrating it for the whole week. Next slide, please. The FMCC has put together a virtual conference of over 30 presentations from people from around the world. And today, Allison is joining us from California. Next slide, please. And here you can see a glimpse of some of the people that have and will be presenting in upcoming webinars. Next slide, please. At this time, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to our presenter, Allison. Allison, the floor is yours. Thank you so much for attending. Is facility management to blame for workplace injuries? Well, how the choices facility managers make can lead to injuries in the workplace. So let's go ahead and explore how that's possible. Thank you so much for joining me today out in webinar land. I really appreciate you signing up. I know your time is valuable. We have 60 minutes, and I'm sure you're going to uh, get a lot of value out of my presentation and leave with some additional tools and strategies to help you in your workplace and to make sure that you're not participating in the blame game as a facility manager. So if you please stay to the end, I have uh, some special gifts for those who uh, participate. Are facility managers to blame for workplace injuries? Well, in this presentation, we'll make sure you have the right priorities to avoid the blame. So we're going to talk about, you know, what exactly are facility management priorities and if they match your priorities. We'll make sure that you're all on the same page with ergonomics and that um, we'll explain how musculoskeletal injuries are, whether they're related to facility design and facility planning. We're going to explore office chairs. Uh, in particular, are, are yours considered an asset or a liability? And then we'll also look at um, the numbers and the data. How are you using predictive analytics to make informed decisions? Uh, finally, we'll start to wrap up with the true value of ergonomics and facility management as a partnership. And then we'll open the floor for some questions and uh, present the special offers and wrap up. So stay tuned for an exciting um, presentation. Before we get too far into this, let me just introduce myself a little bit. I am a, a certified professional ergonomist and a, a certified industrial ergonomist, um, as well as a licensed physical therapist. And I've been passionate about ergonomics for over 25 years. I actually got into ergonomics uh, through my work as a physical therapist by helping injured workers um, in the workplace and in the clinic. And I asked, you know, how were injured workers getting hurt at work? And I asked employers, how were these employees getting hurt? And really, neither of them had the right solutions. And so I decided that my um, expertise and time was better served working directly with employers. Instead of helping one patient at a time, I could now affect an entire um, uh, workforce uh, through a company. So that started my career back in about uh, 1993, believe it or not. I'm actually a pioneer in the industry of um, ergonomics, especially out here in the Bay Area. And I've been studying and developing my business and my skills diligently for the last uh, 25 years or so. Um, I've written a couple books. I'm uh, a writer. 
I do some blogging. Uh, I'm an author, and you can see the book there, Your Guide to Developing an Ergonomics Process. Um, this is something I wrote in uh, early on in my career, about 1999, and it is uh, based on the premise of macroergonomics. Uh, I also have done uh, a number of white paper studies on the impact ergonomics has in the workplace. And in addition, you can find some of my white papers and publications on our website at worksiteinternational.com. And one of the things I really want to point out as a facility manager that I think would be of value to you is our chair assessment system. And we're going to talk a little bit about the value of predictive analytics and how you can use uh, uh, the chair assessment system to help you with um, identifying chair quality and competency as part of this uh, presentation today. Okay, so let's go ahead and get started. First, I, I wanted to tap into the 2016 iOffice survey. Uh, this survey um, sur uh, questioned about 200 facility leaders, and the results of the survey uh, were shown that about 72% felt space management was a critical issue. 51% felt energy optimization was important. They had 46% uh, felt the conference room scheduling was an issue. And about 45% were focused on ergonomics as an important uh, strategy in the workplace for 2016. And being an ergonomist, I felt this was very appealing to me. So um, I want to ask you a quick question. You know, if you're calling in from and listening in from an organization, do you have an ergonomics program? And uh, is it reactive or proactive? Go ahead and just type in for me. Do you have a reactive program where you wait for injuries to occur? Or do you actually have a proactive program and um, um, respond to people's concerns early on? Go ahead and write in your response for me. Is your program reactive or proactive? Or perhaps it's seen as an unnecessary expense and your, your organization really isn't well organized around it. Now, some other comments we've received from um, uh, participants in the similar survey were that uh, employees, uh, facility managers were concerned about standards, establishing and maintaining, finding equipment that works for everyone. Um, of course, they're concerned about uh, lighting, uh, standing and sitting, and uh, repetitive motion causation, and back issues. You know, are chairs just too small or chairs are too big? And um, we'll address some of these concerns in this presentation. So as a facility manager, I want to just be frank with you and ask you, are, um, do you know your work injury trends? Do you know, you know where your work injuries occur? Are you privy to that information? Because it is relevant to how you make your decisions. Who has musculoskeletal disorder injuries related to poor ergonomics uh, in your workplace? You know, which employees are sitting in chairs that are maybe oversized or undersized? or perhaps failing due to poor fit or mechanical incompetency. Or perhaps you have a lot of employees asking for stand-up workstations. Well, why do they want to stand? What, and, and whether the workstations can be modified to fit uh, sit-to-stand opportunities. So a question to you is, you know, do you have the data to drive your facility needs in these areas? And how do you work with your safety and or ergonomic teams? So go ahead and write, write in here that whether you have um, an ergonomics program and whether you have access, just a yes or a no, do you have access to your work injury trends? Are you aware of them? Go ahead and take a moment to respond so I know you're out there. I really appreciate it. Just type in yes or no. Okay. All right, then. <laughs> Moving right along. Thanks so much. So let's make sure we're all on the same page. What is ergonomics exactly? Well, I like to define um, ergonomics uh, a number of different ways. First, literally, it is the science of work. The goal of ergonomics is to improve the design of work and workplaces so workers are more satisfied, more comfortable, healthier, and more productive. And the aim, really, of ergonomics is to produce, you know, and to make sure that employees are happy and healthy where they're working using the op most optimal tools and processes resulting in exceptional levels of productivity. So when you have a workplace that supports you and gives you the tools that are adjustable and you know how to use those tools, then 
you will achieve much more productivity and be more comfortable through the workday. And we like to define ergonomics both uh, at a macro level uh, or what we would consider an organizational approach. So macro ergonomics looks at the socio-technical systems. Uh, it's human-centered design, basically, how we relate to our tasks, our environment, tools and technology, and the organization. We refer to this as macro ergonomics. It's basically big picture ergonomics. Now, on the other hand, a lot of people focus on microergonomics or the individual in the workplace. And that's basically the relationship between you and your work environment. That includes the tools and materials, the tasks that you perform, and the environment in which you perform it in. So now that you are on the same page as me as uh, in understanding ergonomics, let's talk a little bit about the types of injuries that are often related to poor ergonomics and what I consider facility design issues. Um, so, for example here, we often see uh, the placement of the keyboard and mouse on a keyboard tray, and keyboard trays may or may not be uh, selected by facilities. In general, our experiences have been that facilities has a role in selecting work surfaces as well as uh, keyboard trays and platforms. So in the image that you see here, I'll go ahead and use my drawing tool, there's a separation between the mouse and keyboard, the mouse below platform. And this can really contribute to increased wrist extension and strain of the wrist. So selection of a product like this really does not support good ergonomics or uh, healthy postures for the wrist and hands. That's just one example of how the equipment that we provide to employees can contribute to elbow tendonitis or other musculoskeletal disorders in particular to the wrist, forearm, elbow, or hand. Now another issue is tool selection. Uh, in particular, uh, using a mouse. Mouse use is probably one of the number one drivers of musculoskeletal discomfort. For example, in this picture, you can see how worn this mouse is. Look at this wear pattern here, right here. Uh, that's the thumb. This mouse probably has been used for probably over six to eight years. And you can see right here the contact stress that's occurring in relation to the work surface. Now, many times, we'll look at this a little further, but the, the leaning of the wrist on the wrist on the uh, work surface is often related to the, the placement or height of the workstation itself. This can be problematic and, and lead to discomfort and contribute to musculoskeletal disorders of the wrist and hand, in particular with mouse use. Now, the third problem, which you're probably very familiar with, is carpal tunnel syndrome. Carpal tunnel syndrome occurs from performing the same repetitive motions over and over, combined with force and awkward postures. Take a look at the picture of the woman here. Now, one of the main issues that we're concerned about is the height of this workstation relative to her seated elbow height and shoulder height. So her, she is actually reaching out to this work surface because the desk is, is significantly higher than her seated posture and her reach. The proper keyboarding and mouse placement should be with the elbow and shoulder aligned at 90 degrees. And so she actually needs to be working below the work surface height, not above it. And in this scenario, you can't really see, but the desk has a hole right here, a cutout for the keyboard tray. And what's happened is that the keyboard doesn't fit, uh, excuse me, the mouse doesn't fit adjacent to and at the same height as the keyboard. And this results in the awkward uh, overreaching to the work surface. So, you know, the bottom line here is the tools and equipment that facilities purchases and provides to employees uh, can be uh, really contribute to um, the discomfort and exposure to risk factors that employees experience. In particular, most of it is related to posture. And here's a good example, too. The workstation height. Employers and facilities typically set workstations at approximately 30, 29 to 30 inches. But similar for this employee in their neutral seated posture, when their feet are firmly on the floor, their elbow height is only 26 inches. Well, there's a four inch gap between 
or seated elbow height and the desk height. And this contributes to contact stress and uh, leaning on the desktop. So you can see here with the red circle, that is uh, pointing out to you um, where that compression is going to occur. So if the surface is not at the right height, which is typically set too high, we're going to have postural complications that eventually lead to uh, work injuries. Selection of workstation design is problematic in many cases. This shows you an example of workstations that were provided to employees approximately eight years ago in a uh, city environment. And the workstation itself has a slide-out keyboard tray. You can see it abutting to the gentleman's thighs here. Um, but he's working with his keyboard and mouse on the work surface. You can see if we removed the keyboard tray, which extends all the way over to the end here. Let me just dry that, draw that out here. So it goes all the way over to here. And this edge here, if we removed it, we'd be left with this drop-down um, um, uh, surface, excuse me, drop down um, um, containment, uh, a wooden piece from from the from the tray itself, and that would also create a, a risk factor or a hazard for the employee. So this is a really terrible work surface design, the way it's made, and it is not conducive to proper or good ergonomics positioning. Now these are typical workstation designs. Uh, we've got uh, five or six, six, me, six different types of designs for you. Um, and these are what we would consider two-point tasking stations. Uh, let me just uh, use a, a spotlight. So this is a two-point tasking as well as these. Uh, all these are two-point tasking. And when you, what I mean by that is that you primarily use this design to perform more than one or, or two tasks. So for example, computer tasking along with desk reading and writing on the other side. Now, people often take a two-point surface and make it into a three-point by placing the computer right here at this area um, uh, uh, to the corner. Now, what happens, though, is the chair cannot get in proximal because of the armrest. So employees wind up overreaching past uh, the corner to the keyboard. And this is a very tight fit and can become very uncomfortable. Now, if you see employees working with their computer to the corner and leaving the left and right side open for alternative tasks, then you can basically draw the conclusion that your workstations would be better served as a three-point tasking uh, system, such as these designs here, D and E. Uh, these allow for a much more productive use of work surfacing so that you can perform at least three tasks uh, in various areas of the workstation and have ample space to do it to do so. And particularly want to avoid putting cabinetry or files underneath these areas. Now often you'll see a design like E with a keyboard tray here, which works fine, and this one here as well. You just want to make sure you have good clearance to bring the tray forward and away from the radius or the uh, corner. Okay, so a lot of times we'll see surfaces that are designed just like this, and these are very practical. In, in uh, particular, this type of surface can be modified to some extent for sit-stand uh, uh, opportunity by putting using the same existing top, but perhaps using a base. Then the last one, this is single tasking. You really can only perform one dedicated task, and that is primarily computer use. However, people often are um, who have this kind of desk have more than one type of task, and that might uh, require them to overreach or be in an awkward posture for at least one of the tasks performed. Keep in mind that when you perform um, multiple tasks at a single workstation, that um, you can only be in one posture at a time, and as a result, you're always going to be in the wrong posture for the other task. <laughs> Okay, so that is really important to recognize and why it's helpful to have at least a keyboard tray to support alternative postures uh, with multitasking. Now, a lot of uh, facility managers are uh, responsible for or have to respond to standing trends in the workplace. If you're dealing with standing trends, just go ahead and write in 
um, stand up because this is a real a hot button for employers right now. Uh, all uh, Many, many employees are asking for the opportunity to stand and you simply can't blame them. I have some other presentations that I do around this topic and it's really important for our overall health and productivity to alternately sit and stand as well as move more. Um, so here's some of the things that I see employers dealing with. First off, the standalone uh, sit, electric sit-to-stand uh, surface is the best solution to meet a majority of your employees' needs. If your work area and your facilities will allow it, whether it will fit into cubicles or you have freestanding modular furniture, that's another manager matter. It certainly works uh, with um, it, you know, freestanding modular, but uh, making it work in a cubicle is a little bit more challenging. Like I mentioned, you can simply purchase the base, the electric base, and use your existing tops. So I think this is one of the most practical and efficient ways to go. In addition, you want to make sure the range that the desk travels is sufficient to at least 22 inches above the height to probably a maximum of you know, 48 inches or even higher. Some of these workstations go approximately a 30-inch range, which is fantastic to accommodate really your 99 percentile populations. But let's look at some of the other strategies. Here we have um, a combination of a, of a, uh, um, a perching stool and um, a sloped surface that is height adjustable. We have desk on desk solutions. Now keep in mind if you're using desk on desk solutions that you will only be able to uh, bring these surfaces down to the desk height and they will sit slightly above the surface height. And that could be problematic for shorter uh, statured individuals. We have simple just desktop um, podiums that are perfect for like desk reading and writing and easily transported to other locations or put under a desk. We have clamp mount, front mount clamp on uh, sit stand units. Now these type go below the surface. It can be very practical. But at the same time, the surface area is very limiting to just support keyboard and pointing device and possibly document use if you put a document holder or a small surface in here. There's some other options out there. There's many to choose from. And I have to say it can be quite confusing. One of the most important things is that you really use uh, some guidelines and create criteria around what type you will be buying and who is appropriate for standing in the workplace. Not everyone is um, um, physically fit to stand or desires to stand, and many employees think they want to stand, but once they get their standing solution, they do not maximize the opportunity to stand. So it's a rather complex um, um, question and um, implementation. If you need for further assistance, please reach out to me. We have some guidelines on our website we can assist you with. So another thing I wanted to point out is workstation and equipment placement. You can see here that this is a front reception area where the employee sits uh, at a window, but directly behind her is the busy, uh, proxim busy uh, location of the photocopier. So the proximity of machines to employees can be really distractive and disruptive for productivity. Uh, oftentimes, you know, people gather around the uh, photocopier, and this could really be distracting to the employee. So as a facility manager, we recommend that you take consideration into this uh, when you are setting up these um, types of equipment nearby work areas. Another concern that was brought up was lighting. And lighting can certainly cause eye strain and impact musculoskeletal disorders. People report severe headaches and migraines associated with uh, lighting. And, and lighting is very complex, actually, but uh, a lot of times when it's put into the facility, there's not a whole lot of consideration around how it will impact uh, employees. You can see here in this uh, picture of the 911 operator, look at all the glare that's reflected from the lights and the monitors for her. Uh, that can really wreak havoc on your eyes, uh, create um, um, headaches um, and just be uncomfortable over the course of the day. So we really recommend that you consider uh, how you're using your lighting, whether you're going to use task lighting, 
and window coverings, uh, wall coverings, surface coverings, and other, other concerns in this area. Uh, for, by far, the one thing that I haven't talked or touched on yet is the most important office equipment that contributes to employees' productivity. What do you think that is? Go ahead and write in for me what you think is the most important office equipment in your workplace that contributes to employee productivity. Okay, take a second and just write in for me in the chat box um, what you think is the most important office equipment in your workplace that contributes to productivity. Do you think it's the chair? Do you think it's the desk? What do you think it is? Okay, thank you so much for responding. You're right, the chair is the most important, aside from the desk and the computer, which makes us productive. Matter of fact, chairs are foundational in, uh, in the office environment. If you think about the disparity in how we invest in these systems of our computers and IT software and support and systems versus what we spend on chairs, it's, it's very unbalanced. But, you know, in my opinion, the chair is far more undervalued and underappreciated relative to the computer. You know, don't you, don't you think so? I think that chairs are uh, gotten a bad rap to some extent or fly under the radar as far as their importance. So as you re probably realize, prolonged sitting causes postural strain, and this includes muscle strain and trigger points, and this contributes to musculoskeletal injuries in the workplace. As a facility manager, are you responsible for picking the right chairs? We'll ask this question again, but think about it this way. A bad chair distracts from productivity. Would you want to be sitting on this chair all day? It's icky. <laughs> Furthermore, it contributes to and can aggravate musculoskeletal conditions. For example, uh, cervical or neck pain, mid-back pain and lower back pain, buttock and sciatic discomfort, and leg pain. So a bad chair does make a difference. So what makes a, a work chair ergonomic? The main ergonomic requirements and characteristics of a work chair are basically that it's safe to use, that it should not cause accidents, that it should fit about 90% of your users, that it should be physiologically comfortable, so perceived comfort should be very high. The chair and the feature should be practical and easy to use. It should last a long time. Um, and it should be a, an appropriate design for the intended job and environment. So I'm going to give you some examples of how I think we're really uh, missing the boat, so to speak, on you know providing appropriate chairs. So I want you to play along with me here. I'm going to show you a couple pictures. And I want you to figure out whether this is a fit or a misfit. So take a look at Joe. Is this a fit or misfit? Go ahead and write in for me whether you think this is a fit or misfit for Joe. I'll give you a second. Okay, thanks so much for writing in. You're right. This is a misfit. It's totally undersized. Joe is about six foot six. His lower leg height is approximately 21 and a half inches high. But yet this chair, uh, which is, has a reclined bias, uh, only goes to approximately um, 15 inches, or uh, excuse me, it only has a 3-inch pedestal from 14 to 17 inches high, far below his popliteal height. Um, the other thing you might notice is the desk height. Desk is uh, very low for him as well. So we've got a significant mismatch, misfit going on here. Let's try another one. How about Sue? Is this a fit or a misfit? I want you to notice here in the corner uh, the picture I have of her sitting in this chair with a large pillow behind her. Okay, that tells you that the seat is probably too deep and she's not getting enough support. Another thing you can tell about this chair is basically her elbows are inside the armrests. Um, a big clue that it's that it's too wide for her and that her head, her neck is down here relative to the headrest. So this chair does not fit So It's an oversized chair and it's a misfit. Let's try one more. Is this a fit or misfit for Frank? What do you think? The chair itself, 
it's totally, look at how small this back is and unsupportive to the rest of his spine. This is really a, a, also an exceptionally poor fit. There's no ergonomic relationship here for this uh, to provide support over a full day of sitting. Um, and this is significantly problematic. This chair is undersized in many ways, too short in the seat pan, armrests are fixed, can't uh, get in basically closer, and there's no back support. So um, these chairs, which are under the purview of facility management, are really uh, flying, you know, contributing to um, the likelihood of musculoskeletal disorders or discomfort, uh, to say the least. Now let's talk quickly about does one size fit all? I think you probably know the answer to that, which is no. One size does not fit all. It may fit one, but it doesn't fit all. So you can see in these pictures, we have a female who is about uh, five feet tall and a male that's about six foot two, uh, and neither chair, the chair itself does not fit either person very well. However, when you look at the average, the person that's about five foot seven, five foot eight, it fits him effectively, but not the others. And this is one of the problems when you are limited to just one type of chair in the workplace. So how does your organization pick chairs or assign chairs? Are you playing the guessing game when it comes to picking chairs? I like to ask uh, organizations, who is the picker? Who has picked the chair? Um, and then also, how do you manage your chair inventory? Do you have a way of knowing what chair is assigned to who? And is that important? Some of the chairs shown here have, are, are um, being used currently in the workplace. Um, what does this say about who's managing the inventory? And how do you determine proper chair selection? Okay, let's take a look. I mean, look at this. Um, incongruency here, and I see this often. We've got just a regular chair with the employee straddling her legs at a podium to use a laptop. Now she's a greeter uh, at a medical clinic and sitting all day with her back away from the, uh, the seat back, uh, creating compression stress to the buttocks and thighs. This is a nightmare for this employee. Imagine coming to work for 40 hours in this type of posture. It's just not feasible. And yet, who's responsible for this chair and workstation setup? This is a very poor match for the task that needs to be performed. The most facility managers do not use any methodology or objective way. It's based on price or a picture, but not people, and certainly not looking at task performance. Okay, If anything, she should be using a stool. But the reality is this, this setup, this podium, is really not optimal for the task that she's performing, let alone look at where her mouse is up here, uh, right here. Um, that is just a, a recipe for disaster, in my opinion. So, OK. Now, I like to say that you know chairs are like cars. And chair quality and competency, competency matters to assure a good chair fit and comfort. Most of, you know, most chairs have a name and most of them are, you know, can be probably classified into whether, you know, you have a clunker or you have the cool model with all the hot, all the features. So are you driving the clunker or the Ferrari? Um, which do you have? I think it's really, you know, uh, this is a great uh, metaphor for our chairs in the workplace. I've, I've shown you several examples of clunkers uh, that people use day in and day out um, uh, that contribute to musculoskeletal disorders. So when it comes to chair quality and competency, you know, what does a chair say about how an employer values an employee's seated work time and productivity when the chair they're provided with looks like one of these? One of these chairs is in a large healthcare institution. The other is in a, pu a public agency. You know, chairs have a, a lifespan. And what we're looking at here is that chairs are being kept far too long 
and they are failing in competency and quality, contributing to musculoskeletal disorders. Not just that, but imagine coming to work every day and seeing a chair that looks like this. You know, the perceived value and importance of the employee's role in the corporation is really um, diminished when you have a work area like this or you've been provided with tools like this. Another thing to consider is you know that something is wrong with your chairs when you spend a lot of money on seat cushions and back supports for your chair. I mean, you have to ask this, why are they so pervasive? This is a sure sign that something's not quite, quite right with your chairs and the people using them. No wonder employees want to stand up these days, right? We may be sitting too much, but it's what we're sitting on that really counts. If you're seeing lots of back pillows and seat cushions, then as a facility manager, you better, uh, it, you need to stay, take a look at your chairs. This is really important, okay? This is, these two slides to me are very telltale that there's a problem in the workplace. And, you know, by far, please don't judge a seat by its cover. If you look here, the most common areas of failure are the seat cushion and the cylinder. For this reason, you can't judge a seat by its cover. This seat may look very nice and comfortable, but when you sit on it, the seat cushion is mostly air and low-grade foam, and it compresses immediately to where you feel the bottom of the seat pan rather than the top. So you wind up sitting down, you feel the bottom of the seat pan, the hard uh, frame itself, rather than the cushion because it fully collapses, especially in this area. Um, and so this will not hold up very well um, for your employees. It will uh, bottom out, particularly under your sacrum, and is not a good seat for prolonged sitting. This is one of the problems with uh, some of the big box store chairs, which we'll talk about in a minute. And so I want to just say, buyer beware. You know, just because it looks ergonomic or cushiony doesn't mean it really is. And a lot of employers do allow employees to go out and pick their own chair. But I caution you against doing this because they have no uh, frame of reference of what they're picking. And they will pick something that looks just like these two chairs. Uh, in particular, they'll probably pick something like this that's quite cushy looking and executive style, but yet has absolutely zero ergonomic features other than the height adjustment. And uh, so not only that, but this chair will not last for more than probably three years in the workplace based on my observations and experience. So that brings me to ask you a very important question. Are your ergonomic chairs an asset or a liability? Go ahead and take a minute and just write in asset or liability. Take a moment to just use the chat box and write in to me and, um, and let me know, are your, do you think your chairs are an asset or a liability? So let's take a look. You know, when, if your chairs are an asset, they're contributing to employee productivity. You don't get very many complaints. Employee knows, employees know how to use the chair and are comfortable using them. But if your chairs are problematic and don't fit right or unsupportive, then they're most likely a liability. Here's an example of what I mean. This chair was recalled by Office Depot, um, and it, it was uh, about 1.4 million were sold in the workplace, and it's received about 150 reports of this, the seat plate weld cracking or breaking resulting in injuries to the head, neck, and a fractured back and hip, which required medical attention. Now, if you're the facility manager and you've gone out and purchased these chairs, that is a big concern. Here's another recall notice. For this uh, very nice looking uh, manager's chair, the recline function is uh, likely to break when leaning back, posing a fall hazard. Well, you might often buy this chair for that particular reason. And just one more example um, that puts uh, these big box chairs in the category of liability. 
Here this share, which sold about 3,500, um, uh, was recalled for similar reasons of the base breaking away from the chair itself. And at least three people had injuries from falling and hurting their head or other body parts. So, you know, you get what you pay for. This chair is roughly $60, and it's, it's not worth it for the employer to deal with this. This is not only a, a product liability concern, but it's a major work in, injury that uh, ready to happen. Keep these types of chairs in the home office for people that use them away from your workplace. This is a big concern, and so especially for people working 40 hours a week. It's not only is a cheap chair, but it, will last, it won't last more than three years if it's in the workplace. And so you're going to have to replace it probably three to five times more frequently than a well-made warranty chair. And that's the point here. When it comes to office chairs, you get what you pay for, okay? Uh, there's no way around it. Now, office task chairs, if you haven't followed along with me so far, I, 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 I just feel that they are a root cause in most seated work injuries and cost employers, based on the state average here in California, almost 40000 per claim. That's crazy when the average cost of a good ergonomic chair is about $500. If you agree and you've had, you've had some um, opportunities to, to uh, um, evaluate and look at chairs, American-made chairs are worth uh, the investment. And we'll look at some return on investment as a result of investing in a good ergonomic chair. So when it comes to chair performance, there, there are approximately five primary areas of failure that I want to go over with you. Okay. So first, it looks bad. <laughs> All right. That's probably, I've shown you a lot of chairs that just look bad. And when they start to look bad, that's a problem. That means that they're not being maintained. They're not being cleaned. Uh, they're not being, uh, the fabric is not holding up well. Uh, another is that they lack support, leading to discomfort. So I've showed you several chairs in that category. Um, there's a mechanical failure. So the cylinder or the pedestal will fail. The tilt and back tension or recline tension will fail. Or the levers and knobs stop working. Or they break off. Uh, or they just don't engage properly. So it looks bad. It doesn't provide support. Or there's mechanical failure of some kind. Um, and then, of course, breakage and wear down. So the foam breaks down, the fabric tears or breaks down, the plastic cracks, the casters no longer roll. Uh, and finally, the sanitation factor. This is one that really drives me crazy. Um, oh, man, hair, human and pet, uh, hair, dandruff, dead skin, body fluids like urine. Uh, and I won't say what else, but you get the picture. I call this the cootie factor. And it's disgusting. <laughs> Let me know what you think. Are your chairs Mr. Clean or are they pig pen? Go ahead and type it in for me. Um, you know, the bottom line here is that a lot of our chairs are just not fit for duty and they need to be removed. <laughs> I think this is probably one of the most important things you can uh, get out of uh, this presentation is just being more aware of chair performance and the primary areas of failure. So here's a, a great example of chair failure I want to show you. Okay, so we'll just take a second. I'll open this video for you. You don't have to hear the sound. I just want you to see what happens when a chair cylinder is likely to fail. Uh, so we'll play it one more time for you. If your chair uh, uh, acts like a slow sinking ship, uh, then it's definitely time to replace the cylinder which may be under warranty or provide a new chair in general. Okay, chair cylinders should not do this. Uh, that's a big warning sign, red flag. Okay, so go ahead and close that for you and get out of that. Okay. I think it's playing in the background. One second, let me fix that for you. Uh, Oh, shoot. 
Sorry, we're having some technical difficulty here. Let me stop that. Okay. And sorry about that. Minimize that. Oh, did I lose the whole thing? Are you there, Josh? I'm here. Okay, sorry about that, folks. Hold on. You made that transition and it didn't work so well. Here we go. Okay. So, how many misfits and failures do you have? I want you to take this poll for me. Did you set up the poll, Josh? Yeah, if you finish reading the question, I'll launch it. All right. Approximately how many of your ergonomic chairs are misfits or chairs not properly sized to fit your employees, such as too big, too small, too wide, or too deep? Go ahead and respond. You, you think 10%, 25%, 50%, 75% or more than 90%. Please take a minute and uh, respond to the poll. Okay, let me know when people are uh, answering. You can just write in directly to me. There's, uh, we just have a small audience here, so it shouldn't take too long if everyone is paying attention to the webinar. <laughs> uh, has anyone responded yet? Yeah, we're about to close it out in just a second. All right. Thank you. Okay. You're welcome. It looks like 25% was the answer. Okay. 25% of chairs are misfits. And let's do this. I'm not surprised about that um, because we are really assigning chairs in a very random way. We'll talk about that in just a second. Um, and then the next question, how many, uh, approximately how many of your chairs are at the end of their life cycles? More than 10 years old for a USA made chair, more than three to five years old for import chairs from catalog or office supply stores. Do you think you have 10%, 25%, 50, 75% or more than 90% of your chairs are older than 10? Go ahead and open the poll, please. Mm -hmm. Okay. 50% said 10% and 50% said more than 90%. Oh, wow. Okay. So the ones that are in the 90% category, um, you really need to pay heed to what I'm saying because they are probably past their life cycle. We'll talk about life cycles in a second for chairs. So thank you so much for participating in that uh, those polls. So how do you track your chair assets? Are you, um, do you assess the ongoing performance of your chairs as a facility manager? Do you inventory what you have? Do you know which chairs work for employees, which don't, and why? And what criteria do you have to determine what works best and what fits best? I think these are critical questions to answer. So if you have answers to these questions, um, or you can say, you can say, I have the answers, or our butts are in trouble. You know, thinking about how long a chair will remain in the workplace, for example, the one shown, this has been in the workplace since 1992. That's 25 years old. We don't keep our mattresses, our couches, or our computers that long. Why are we keeping chairs so long, right? And then finally, you know, how many complaints do you get from employees about chairs? Now, one of the things that I've noticed if you've answered, is that um, if you've, you know, uh, had the same observations, is that we assign chairs often in a willy-nilly fashion. I've seen big and tall in small seats and small petite in oversized chairs because no one took the time to properly assign the chair to the end user. So the saying that one size fits all is not true, when I, especially, you know, given my earlier conversation. Even chairs theoretically designed to fit the 5th to 95th percentile will fit actually many far fewer people. So this is really important. How are you assigning chairs? So we have small people in big chairs and big people in small chairs. So facility managers, in my opinion, and from my experience as a professional ergonomist, helping other facility managers and helping employers is that they need a way to develop uh, chair standards based on employee tasks, anthropometrics, or the measure of individuals, chair fit, and comfort. They need a way to inventory chairs for preventive maintenance and sustainability. 
to objectively measure chair quality and competency in a way that helps them to make decisions and to assure chairs fit users. And finally, to prioritize a budget for chair replacement, um, uh, excuse me, for chair repairs and replacement, as well as to purchase new ones. Now, based on my research and observation, I think these are the most critical things that facility managers need to be mindful of when it comes to chairs. So I like to ask the question, where do your chairs lie on the ergonomic chair risk timeline? Are they in the low risk or high risk? And we use the color code, keep, uh, repair, or replace. You can see red, yellow, and green. Now, a majority of employees can, employers can ask to answer this question. Can you answer it? Type in low risk, moderate, or high risk for the majority of your chairs. And what I'm talking about here is the life cycle of a chair. And uh, what we've done is develop this life cycle model. So chairs are, uh, that are relatively new and adjustable and in good condition are certainly in the keep category. But as they get older, preventive maintenance is necessary, and they should be uh, repaired while they're under warranty. And then as they get older, once they are repaired, or even if they're past that, then they definitely need to be replaced. And if you're going to replace your chairs, then you need to fit them. So this is a very easy chair life cycle model to remember keep, repair, replace, and fit. Now this is an example of our uh, uh, chair assessment system uh, inventory program that we use to help our clients. And you can see I've circled here um, where we have inventoried individual people's chairs. Um, uh, and we ID them and what cubicle they're in, and the department, the location, the manufacturer of the chair, the model, chair year, how many shifts it's used, and then we rate using a three-point scale of good, fair, or poor chair quality and competency. And that goes into an algorithm, and it'll tell you whether you should keep, repair, or replace the chair. So very easy to do, um, but you do have to assess each individual chair. Okay. Now we developed a dashboard as a result of this uh, spreadsheet, and the dashboard tells you everything you need to know, what chairs you have, how many chairs uh, need to be repaired or replaced. And you can tell by the color coding consistently with keep, repair, or replace which chairs hold up the best, which are uncomfortable by manufacturer model or by department. And the color coding really helps to keep you focused on how to manage your chair inventory or your what we like to call your chair fleet. So it answers vital questions. Now, uh, another question that I've, uh, you know, when I'm working with facility managers is that uh, whether you track your chairs um, for preventive maintenance or whether you track your chairs to uh, when they need repair. And, and if not, then you are leaving money on the table. Let's say the chair fits, but it scores as repair. So how will you fix it? How will you fix a chair as soon as, as you've seen, many chairs go unrepaired but continue to be used for hours on net end? And this, we know, can lead to substantial risk of harm, even resulting in injury. Ironically, most employers leave money on the table and don't use their warranties. So use your warranty because you are losing money otherwise. And this is a particularly important if you've purchased chairs that have a 10-year uh, or a three to five or 10 year warranty. And of course, warranties will vary by the uh, certain parts of the chair. Do you know what your employees are sitting on? You know, whether your chairs are under warranty or not, um, you need to know what you have in your inventory. So I, I showed you, you can, you can look at the underside of the seat here and identify the year, the make, and the model of the chair. So this is a great way to tell at least uh, one factor, which is the age of the chair, and um, to document what you have and how old it is. It's kind of like the VIN number of your car. Once you have this information, you can reach out to the vendor or the manufacturer to learn about your warranty details. So what does this really say? I, I really like this quote from iOfficeCorp.com. The workforce and workplace data 
is as critical to successful facility managers as wrenches and screwdrivers are to successful vehicle maintenance. Facility managers need to know about every available asset from IT equipment to specialized tools and coffee filters, about every resource to calculate the cost and minimize the downtime uh, and maximize the utility of your assets. So data about your ergonomic assets, in particular your chairs, the quality and competency, the number and type of chairs um, that are occupied is really important. And preventive maintenance is necessary to manage this inventory. So, but I really feel that it's been left out of the equation for facility managers. So don't forget about your chairs. The chair assets need monitoring. You need predictive analytics to answer action critical questions that include what chair assets do you own? Where are they? How are they used and performing? And are they failing and putting employees at risk? Don't rely on employees to let you know when there's a problem with the chair because they just don't know what to do. They don't know how to report to, and they are really oblivious to uh, chairs that are failing, unfortunately. All they know is what they feel, okay? So an office chair asset management system provides predictive analytics to improve operations and avoid asset failure. So remember, keep, repair, replace, and fit. That's the cycle. And you need to be measuring um, your chair quality and competency to assure uh, safe use and minimize exposure to musculoskeletal disorders. You know, office chairs are a system. They need to be managed. And as Peter Drucker, the management guru, said, you can't manage what you can't measure, and if you can't measure it, you can't improve it. So as much as we sit and depend on our chairs, we're undervaluing and underestimating the importance and vitality of our ergonomic chairs in today's modern office. Your chairs tell a story of the health and performance of your employees. They're essential to our productivity. When you treat your chairs as an asset to be managed, you gain a comprehensive formalized inventory process in real time that's measurable and objective for improvement, that's part of a preventive maintenance and life cycle asset management program, and it's vital to assure safe and healthy seated workforce. It also helps to assure the best fit and comfort for employees, and typically will help you work within purchasing and budgeting parameters because you will only need to replace those chairs that truly need to be replaced. You can sort out your standards from non-standards, and really it's easy to use something like this. You can have your ergonomic teams or uh, supervisors or even employees, as well as purchasing facilities or maintenance, help you with inventory your, um, chair, your chairs in the workplace. So, so much value out of this. And as a result of that, we can really expect uh, a very proactive uh, return on investment, uh, which is based on your total savings projected and the cost of a proactive ergonomics process. Now, I mentioned that I had uh, conducted some studies over the years. My uh, most recent one is a five-year prospective study of a macro ergonomics process demonstrating significant prevention of workers' comp claims resulting in projected savings. I know that's a mouthful. But what it really says is that a proactive ergonomic program tells companies what issues need to be addressed by a good ergonomic design and training so interventions can effectively be implemented before injuries and productivity losses occur. And in our study, the results were profound. For every dollar invested, $10 was saved. And this is compared to approximately a $3 savings when you invest in in a uh, wellness program. So ergonomics has a very high return on investment. The more you invest, um, excuse me, initially, your initial investment is the most critical, and that investment will continue to pay off in years to come. So when you invest in good quality products that are well designed, uh, including um, good chairs, you're going to see substantial return on investment over time. And here's a couple of figures that we've come up with. So if you buy a new chair versus having a claim fired, you're going to save $80 to to $1. So for every claim that's filed because of a seated work injury, if you replace the chair or provided some education 
and I'm saying a good ergonomics chair, you can save about $80 for every dollar invested. When you invest in your chair inventory process, you're going to uh, spend about $2 per chair uh, as part of your investment. Uh, and this is basically you spend more on coffee and pencils in your workplace <laughs> than chairs. And then, of course, the savings in using the warranty to fix a chair you would have normally replaced before its time, I would estimate about a 50% savings there before you have to replace the chair. So, yeah, you do put off the inevitable, but you extend that cost over a much longer period of time. And most of the time, the warranty, the uh, you pay for the labor, but you don't necessarily pay for the parts. So these are some ways that you can achieve a return on investment. Okay. So I want to start to wrap up. I've presented a lot today, and I really appreciate you, you staying with me. Um, the most important takeaway here, uh, in addition to some of the things I spoke about earlier, is that chairs matter a lot. A bad chair matters more. But a good chair matters even more. So my advice to you is don't get caught in the blame game. Facilities manager, facility manager's role is to make more informed decisions by understanding the importance of good ergonomics, define the uh, standards to reflect well-designed ergonomic accessories and chairs, use predictive analytics to help you, uh, respect the chair life cycle, use an objective data-driven process to keep, repair, and replace your chairs. The person that responded at 90%, you know, it may be that you don't have to replace all of these at once, and that's how you can make that decision, by using this as some sort of inventory tool. The furniture you select and the workstation setup contributes to employee health, wellness, and productivity. And understanding chair fit and function and your employee demographics will help you make better decisions. And you can provide this information to leadership and EHS support by replacing chairs as often as feasible to assure quality and competency. So don't get caught up in the blame game. It's really important that you use the tools to make better decisions around your ergonomics, uh, furniture purchases, and chair purchases. So with that in mind, I'm going to just go ahead, go through some special offers, and then I'll open the floor for some questions. I'm offering, for those of you that participated today, in a free trial uh, for using our chair assessment tool form. And you can easily assess uh, five chairs uh, for your free trial. And we'll send you the database and the dashboard results after you use the chair assessment tool. Uh, and this it'll look like this, obviously, just with five chairs. You'll get the dashboard and the database. Okay. So this is a free trial using the chair assessment tool, which is part of the chair assessment system. You conduct your chair assessments and return them to us, and we'll send you your database and dashboard results. That is tremendous value to get you started in inventorying your chairs. Um, and you just have to go to our website at worksiteinternational.com for the chair assessment system try it link. And you'll see that right under the chair assessment system on our worksiteinternational.com page. Now we're also offering, if you like the product and you want to subscribe, we have a month-to-month -month subscription of 10 chairs a month or an annual subscription up to 120 chairs. So if you don't have a large uh, organization or you just want to focus on your high-risk chairs, you can do this. Or we have licenses available for up to 10,000 or more employees. Um, and I've shown some of the pricing here. Uh, you get a lot of value. There's many things that come with the chair assessment system, and you can learn all about it at worksiteinternational.com. Um, we are also offering, for those of you who have stayed on here, you can contact us for a free chair assessment system online demo and 20-minute free consultation. All you have to do on our homepage at worksiteinternational.com is uh, fill out the learn more about us um, or go directly to the chair assessment system page and fill out one of our uh, landing pages and we'll get right in touch with you for the 20 minute consult and the online demo. What I've presented today here is very valuable. 
If you want to learn more about anything I discussed tonight, I'm offering this complimentary 20-minute uh, present, a uh, 20 minute consult for you. And one other um, gift that I have for you is if you sign up tonight or at any time on my website, it, you'll receive our free ebook, Sitting Pretty and Sitting Healthy, a guide to office chair selection and use. And also our Stand Up for Your Health Sit to Stand guidelines. So if any of you respond to me this evening or tomorrow in the next uh, few days, um, we will send you this. These are available through our landing pages in our resources section. We have a free resources. Just go ahead and sign up tonight for these products. Just one other thing, and we'll open it for questions. I've just got a couple other events. Tomorrow is the Virtual Ergonomics Summit. You can still sign up for, and I'm going to be talking more about chair posture and fit. And then coming soon, I have a pilot training program ergonomics for the non-ergonomist. And this is designed for facility managers, purchasing uh, individuals, people who have responsibilities for ergonomics in the workplace, but they don't necessarily have the skills or knowledge to really help them feel confident. So we have an online survey um, under our, um, at our events page. Please take the survey if you're interested in um, being put on our mailing list for when we launch this exciting online training program. Um, <clears throat> so with that, um, if you liked or didn't like what I had to say, please comment on our webinar satisfaction survey on our website and the IFMA survey that I'm sure you'll receive shortly. Okay, and so finally, I'd like to all open this for some questions. I know there's some attendees who have stayed the whole time. I really appreciate it. I don't know, Josh, if you can open the mics. Um, for the three folks that have joined us, and uh, time is short, so uh, go ahead and open it for some questions. Sure. You can also write them in. Yep, if you have any questions, you certainly can type them in, or if you want to be unmuted, I can um, unmute you. We'll give them just a moment, see if they have any questions. Okay. Can you go to the next slide? And did you have your email up where they can contact you? Did you have that on a previous one? I don't remember seeing that. Okay, next slide. Okay. I do want to let you know I am thankful for you guys being here. We do have another webinar coming up. And Allison's email, if you do have any questions, is allison at worksiteinternational.com. Worksite International. And I can send that out to you in a post-webinar email here. I'll send it out to everyone in the chat box. So there we go. There we go. And she's also providing the phone number, so I will send out to, to the entire audience in the chat box as well. So if you look in the chat box, you have her email and a phone number for her. And if you do have time, I would love to see you at our, the any of our upcoming webinars. Also, the FMCC does like to bring attention to the other councils and communities that are here at IFMA and the great resources they offer. Next slide, please. Thank you for joining us. And Allison, thank you for a very interesting webinar on about chairs and ergonomics. And you, people need to do more maintenance and replacing of their chairs. You should not have a chair for 25 years. <laughs> thank you, Allison. Everyone have a great day. Take care. Bye-bye.